All right. So I'm Professor David Lummis, and uh, Professor Matsota asked me to come in and substitute for him today since he's traveling and can't be here. So I guess we'll get started. And I just wanted to, right, since there was a midterm last time, remind you more or less of what he was talking about whenever he left off. Um, the last lecture, I suppose, was about the relationship between Statius and Virgil, the specifically poetic relationship, and the ambiguity that arises in the father-son relationship that's staged between Statius and Virgil. So Statius recognizes the centrality of Virgil for his own poetic career and his own moral development by saying, through you, I was a poet, and through you, I was a Christian. But at the same time, um, his poetry challenges that of, of Virgil. Professor Matsota concluded, you know, stating that um, Stagius, Stagius' poem is about a tragedy, about the tragedy of birth, right? While Virgil's is about the, um, the history-making quality of the event of birth. That the Thebaid challenged Virgil's account of, of, the foundation, of, the of foundation and of history, but he grew as a poet and converted to Christianity by engaging with Virgil's own ideas of history, specifically with the uh, fourth eclogue. And there, there's a misreading. So the generative quality of, of Virgil's poetry didn't, wasn't intrinsic in the poetry itself, but was based on Statius's particular reading of the text. Um, and today we're going to be talking about Cantos 24 and 26 specifically, but I'll be saying a few words also about Cantos 23 and 25 as a kind of frame to those two conti. Um, and in these two Cantos 24 and 26, um, they conti continue the, um, the meditation on poetic relationships that we're going on in 21 and 22 with Statius. Now, Professor Matsota in his book, The Dante, the Poet of the Desert, has pointed out that Dante utilizes the figural method of reading history, uh, whereby the past prefigures the present and the future um, in a poetic fashion in order to understand um, the genealogy of poetry, of poets in order to place himself in a typological genealogy of poets. Um, and in these kanti, Dante is engaged in a kind of, in a sustained reflection, Masota says, on literary history and the powers of literature to engender moral conversion, and in probing the inevitable limits of poetic fictions. And there I quoted from his book, um, Dante, Poet of the Desert. Now, since Canto 24, which we read for today, follows directly on Canto 23, with a conversation between Fores de Donati and the Pilgrim, I want to say a few words about 23, um, especially regarding the relationship between, between poetry and gluttony. Okay? Now, although a number of penitents are mentioned at the beginning of this canto, Dante only speaks to two of them, Fores de Donati and Bona Giunta da Luca. And both of them are poets. And the first one is specifically a friend of Dante, okay? Um, now, Forese Donate, Donat, Forese Donati was, in, in Dante's youth, um, like I said, a friend, and they exchanged a series of vituperative sonnets in which they insulted each other back and forth, and it was filled with, um, with language of bodily sensation. And um, uh, I suppose in this canto, the language of the conversation between Forese and the Pilgrim um, sheds a new, uh, the memory of it causes a bitterness in both Forese and in the Pilgrim. And the difference between the rhetoric of the two um, texts uh, marks a new moral vision in the Pilgrim, okay? So but before in these, in these sonnets, they berated each other's wives and um, 
and their, their vices. In this canto, they recognize each other, they treat each other like brothers. So it's really a um, reformation of a poetic community that was, in some sense, distorted by these two son by these, in reality, six sonnets, three for each poet. <coughs> um, and in, the, in this canto, the gluttonous are famished and disfigured by hunger, and they're penitent, right? And Donati's wife, Forza Donati's wife, is recalled, and she was treated with obscenity in the sonnets, and she's remembered as a stilnovistic kind of woman um, whose prayers, ironically, have helped Forese arrive at the terrace so quickly, right? So in a, in a way, it, re it converts that kind of gluttonous bodily poetry into a different kind of moralized, moralizing poetry, I suppose. All right? It, it corrects it. Now, I guess the connection, another connection with gluttony is that Forese, along with a number of other Italian poets, such as Cecco Angiolieri, um, who was probably the most famous, was a burlesque poet, and this is also known as Goliardic poetry. So from gula, the, uh, Latin for throat or for gluttony. Um, and so this sort of oblique connection allows Dante to speak about poetry in this canto of, of gluttony, all right? <coughs> it's the real connection is that it's a, worldly, it's a worldly type of poetry that doesn't look beyond itself, beyond the um, concerns of the flesh, I suppose, <coughs> all right? Um, I'd like to point out at the end of this canto, um, Dante remembers their ribald literary exchange with, with bitterness. At lines 115, at the very end, um, he connects the, the period of his friendship with Donati with a dilemma back in the dark forest in canto one. Okay? Um, let's see if we're at the right place. If thou bring back to mind what thou, ha what thou wast with me, and I with thee, the present memory will be grievous still. So he, he's pointing out that he has a different perspective on that time of his life. Okay? He that goes before me turned me from that life some days ago, when the sister of him, and I pointed to the son, showed herself round to you. It is he that has led me through the profound night of the truly dead, with this true flesh that follows him. His suckers have drawn me up thence, climbing and circling the mountain which straightens you, whom the world made crooked. So, <coughs> the motor, I guess, of, his, of, his, of this change that Dante experiences are both Virgil and Beatrice. So he's pointing towards what's making him, what's, what makes him different from what he was a few days ago. So, <coughs> and the, actually the exchange with Forese was probably not that long before the uh, composition of the Divine Comedy, okay? Or at least not that long before the, um, the fictional date of, of the Divine Comedy. Um, and this, in reality, I guess, pre is a prelude to how he dramatizes the differences between the, his poetry and that of his fathers and brothers, the ones that he meets in 24 and 26, okay? That's just as a preface, I suppose, to what happens in 24, where Dante really just juxtaposes his own style of poetry with that of his predecessors, specifically embodied by Bonajunta da Luca. And it's interesting that Bonajunta, who notices that Dante um, is different, right? Because <coughs> uh, Bonajunta da Luca wrote a poem to Guino Guirizelli, who we will meet in 26, criticizing how he had brought the terminology of the university, the terminology of epistemology and of metaphysics and of theology into the, the lyric of love, okay? So it's, that's probably one of the reasons why Bonajunta comes out here. Not necessarily that he was important for some specific reason to Dante, but probably because of that, the fact that he, he came out and noticed this um, in public of Guinizelli. Okay, this chain. Mm. So I'd like to have a look at, in the text, um, when Bonajunta comes out 
and addresses Dante. Okay? <clears throat> he says it at, at verses 49 through 51, um, But tell me if I see here him that brought forth the new rhymes, beginning with ladies that have intelligence of love. So it's Bonagunta who, who recognizes Dante and specifically by the first line in Kippet to the poem that, that basically makes the center of the Vita Nuova, the turning point in the Vita Nuova, as you'll remember. Because <coughs> um, in, in, this, in this poem, <coughs> it, it really marks the transition from a self-centered poetry of love, where the poet praises himself obliquely by service to the woman, to the lady uh, who he loves, and his transition to a poetry of praise that is mingled with metaphysical claims for the lady's value. So it's, it's Dante's transition from a courtly lyric to a more um, philosophical lyric. Okay? <coughs> now Dante responds to, to Bonagiunta with a really beautiful, <laughs> beautiful phrase. And he says, And I said to him, I am one who, when love's, love breathes in me, take note, and in that manner which he dictates within, go on to set it forth. Okay? So this, is Dante's claiming his novelty, right? Um, and at the same time, he's saying, <coughs> he's linking his own writing of poetry to the activity of a scribe. Right? He says, I take note when someone, when, when love dictates. Right? So he's, he's explaining his inspiration. Right? In the Italian, um, the word for breathe in is spira. Okay? And he takes, he dictates within Dante. Okay? <coughs> now, This inspiration, I think, should it needs to be understood. It needs to be understood in a theological manner. It needs to be understood theologically. Um, as we'll go on, I'm going to go on to talk about Canto 25, and this, which explains this retrospectively, um, in a moment. But let me say for now that it, that the words uh, noto and like take note in Italian, and um, dicta or dictate in Italian. Um, point towards uh, the, um, the inspiration as this breathing in as the Holy Spirit, okay? As a movement of love within the Trinity. And that Dante is explaining how, um, how poetic inspiration is a p really a parallel to the unity of the Trinity, okay? <coughs> um, this inspiration comes from within. Um, but it, it's like someone who dictates from without, okay? Now, in the, in the, in the, monar in the Monarchia, Dante's um, political treatise on uh, empire, um, he describes God as the only dictator, the only person who dictates, okay? So we have to understand this, um, this description of poetic inspiration as one coming from um, an internal I instantiation of the divine, okay? So there's a connection between this inspiration and the divine, okay? Um, now, Bonagiunta follows up on this by professing to understand the knot, right? The knot that kept him um, and his like, the Guitone d'Arezzo, Giacomo d'Alentini, who is the notary, um, from arriving at that style. At, at the tercet that begins at line 55, he says, Oh, brother, he said, now I see the knot that held, me, held back the notary and Guitone and me, short of the sweet new style that I hear. I see well how your pens followed close behind the dictator, which assuredly did not happen with ours. And he that sets himself to examine further sees nothing else between the one style and the other. And as if satisfied, he, went, he was silent. So, Bonadunta thinks, you know, uh, he has this perspective that purgatory gives him on his past life, and he understands that not. And the, the nodo is also used to describe the sin of gluttony 
in, at the beginning of Canto 23. So here again we have this lack of moral understanding, this lack of moral perspective in life being um, paid for in the afterlife in purgatory. Um, okay. Um, but the, so the poetry that Bonajunta represents um, was one that concentrated on worldly beauties and qualities, like I said before. It feigned a service to the lady only to concentrate on the self of the poet, and it never really went beyond, um, went beyond itself. It was a self-reflexive kind of poetry. Um, and in that sense, I guess, it could be assimilated with gluttony. Um, and then it absorbed and imitated what came with from without, without offering forth anything, without being generous, such as the poetry of Virgil was. And it, um, it, it's interesting, and interesting enough, um, Bonajunta says, um, him that brought forth the new, the new rhymes, so he brought the new rhymes forth. He offered them out, okay? So Bonajunta is able to see the difference between the two styles of poetry at this point, but I think he doesn't recognize um, the kind of uniqueness that Dante is, is claiming um, for himself here. Because he, he says um, that your pens follow close behind the dictator, right? So he's pluralizing what Dante says only about himself. He says in Italian, I, I mi son un che, okay? And people have pointed out that this, um, I am one who is both humble, and that it's like I'm one of other, among others who do this, but it's also a, um, it's also pointing out it's his uniqueness. Others have pointed out that it, um, it echoes line um, 314 of Exodus, ego um, sum qui sum, which is what God says to Moses, I am who I, I am who am, okay? That this self-reflexive i son un, mi son un ke is an expression of uniqueness, okay? Couched in humble language, okay? So Dante is really pointing out that he is, he is <coughs> doing something unique with his poetry um, that perhaps Bonajunta doesn't really recognize to the full extent, okay? So he's, if there is a school of the dolce stil nuovo, all right, if there is this sweet new style which <coughs> composes a school, right? Like the Sicilian school that preceded it, which I'm sure Professor Matsoka talked about in relation to the Vita Nuova. Um, then Dante is creating something new within that school, okay? That's, I think, what's going on here in those lines, um, okay? All right. Um, so <coughs> I suppose what, what Dante is doing in this canto is marking a, a, an extreme contrast between his own poetry and that of the people who came before him, okay? Um, there is a line that divides these two schools, you know, the Guitone, who is a uh, Tuscan poet who imitated Sicilian poetry. The Sicilians who imitated the Provencal poetry. He's s detaching himself from them because of uh, their lack of a moral purpose, I suppose, in their poetry, which Bonajunta recognizes retrospectively. All right. Now I just wanted to point out, as the um, it, this sort of uh, as this comes as this conversation comes to an end. Dante describes at um, the Terse 64 through 69 how the uh, penitents depart. He says, as birds that winter along the Nile sometimes make a troop in the air, then fly with more speed and go and file, so all the people that were there facing round quicken their steps, being light with both leanness and desire. Okay. And as one tired with running lets his companions go on and then walks till the heaving of his chest is so relieved, so for as it let the holy flock pass and come on with me behind. Okay? So I just wanted to point out the contrast here. The image of birds probably reminds us of the image of birds in Canto V of the Inferno. Right? That they were the sinners were described as cranes who were being buffeted about by a tempest. Right, and they kept returning to the same spot in a circle, like an eternal return, okay? Um, <coughs> here, the same kinds of 
birds, right, this, these love poets, <laughs> right, are coming together in a troop and moving along together. And not only are they moving along together, they're moving forward, all right? So there's a progress that's, uh, count, uh, that opposes the circularity of the, of the storm of birds in uh, Inferno 5. And this will come up again also in Canto 26. Um, now, I know we didn't, didn't read it for today, um, Canto 25 of Purgatory. But I think it sheds some light. I'm going to say a few words about it because I think it sheds some light on what Dante is talking about in relation to inspiration. Okay, we talked about that earlier. Um, now, it, what, da- what happens here is Dante asks, Dante is perplexed about how the sinners can be punished with their bodies if they don't have bodies. So he asks this of Statius, right? So the, the whole canto, basically, he asks this of, of, of Virgil, I guess, and Virgil says, it's better if Statius explains it to you, okay? And <coughs> um, so the pretext of it all is, how can this happen? What is the physics of it? What is the biology of the soul, basically, in the afterlife? But what Statius does in explaining this, explains um, how God engenders the soul, how he, how he creates the soul, okay? Um, now, is it placing this discourse of the generation of the, of the soul and the body between two cantos that are basically all about poetic inspiration, Dante, I think, is drawing a parallel between um, divine inspiration and divine creation and poetic generation and poetic creation, okay? Um, okay. <laughs> he's using it as a parallel. He's making a parallel between um, poetic generation inspiration from um, and poetic inspiration and the divine creation of the of the soul, the inspiration of the divine um, in, the, in the creation of the soul. I, I'm going to go on and explain what I mean. <laughs> I just wanted to get that. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, I'll slow down a second. Um, all right. So basically, if, if he's staging here um, the relationship between predecessors and new poets, so himself and his past, basically. So he's explaining how he is born out of the past, but is not imitative and is not can't be merely reducible to that past. Okay. Um, I can read a little bit of this. It's um, it's a bit scholastic, I suppose, but that's okay. Um, now. I can read it all if you want. It might explain it better for you. Uh, he says. At lines 40, uh, 38, I believe, 37, 38. Perfect blood, which is never drunk by the thirsty veins and is left like food, thou removest from the table, takes in the, takes in the heart and forming power for all the bodily members, like that which takes its course through the veins to become these. Further digested, it descends where a silence is, is fitter than speech, and then drops afterwards on another's blood in the natural vessel. There the one mingles with the other, and the one fitted to be the passive, and the other on account of the perfect place from which it springs, that is the heart, (coughs) active. And this, so united, begins to operate, first coagulating, then quickening that to which for its material it has been, it has given consistency. Now, here I think it gets a little bit more interesting. He says, the active force having become a soul, like a plant, uh, but so far different that it is on the way and the other already on the shore, then operates to the point that it moves and feels, like a sea fungus. And from that goes on to produce organs for the faculties of which it is the seed. Now, my son, (coughs) develops and spreads the force that is from the heart of the begetter, where, the, where nature makes provision for all the members. But how from animal it becomes a child, thou, thou seest not yet. And I'm going to skip a little bit more to the top of the next page. Open thy breast to the truth that follows, and know that as soon as the articulation of the brain is perfected in the embryo, the first mover turns to it, rejoicing over such handiwork of nature and breathes it into it, a new spirit. He breathes into it, just like the inspiration um, that Dante claimed for his own poetry before, (coughs) 
um, a spirit full of power which draws into its own substance that which it finds active there, and it becomes a single soul that lives and feels and is itself revolves upon itself. So what I think is, is going on here is that, <coughs> you know, ostensibly, basically, um, Statius describes the creation of the body, or the biological creation of the body, which comes from the mingling of bloods, right? Um, <coughs> and then after that, how the animal that is created, basically, is given a soul by God, becomes a rational, becomes a human being. And the human being, the human here is described, he s just translates it as a child, but the word that's actually used is a fante. Now, fante would be basically de it was derived from the Greek word for speech. So fante would be a per one who speaks. So how an animal becomes one who speaks. So humanity is, is defined, in a sense, by the fact that we can speak and reason, basically. <coughs> OK? Um, and what happens here, I suppose, is that even though the father is the, gen it generates the, um, the body, the soul is directly created by God, okay? That, so that there's two kinds of individualities, I suppose. You have the body and the soul, and the soul is a, is a uniqueness that is directly created and inspired by God. So if we consider this poetically, <coughs> even though Dante may have been influenced, or in, in a sense created by the poets that came before him, nonetheless, he has some kind of direct inspiration that separates him from the poets that came before him. At least that's how I understand it. Okay? And I, I think it's connected, but Dante points out the connection, especially by the word spira. He uses the word spira or inspiration twice. Right? They, imi they imitate each other. They parallel each other. Okay? And the connection between fante, this, the child who speaks, is a direct connection to language. Okay? <coughs> The language of poetry. All right. All right. So that's, I think, it, it explains ret retrospectively what Dante is claiming in Canto 24, okay, about <coughs> his poetic inspiration. This difference between his own poetry and that of, that of his predecessors. Now, Canto 26. We can pass on to Canto 26. He passes in to the terrace of the lustful. All right. And here he meets his own, his own staged poetic father, um, Guido Guinizelli. And he has his father, recon he recognizes his father and his, he, his debt to his father. And at the same time, he is recognized as a brother by his father, okay? So his, his individuality as a poet is recognized. The recognition is staged here, okay? It, the, paternal the paternal relationship becomes a fraternal one. Um, so I guess this, it, what I'm trying to point out with this the biological embryology um, is that he can be seen as derivative and different at the same time. So he's the same and is distinguishable at the same time. Okay. <coughs> now this canto is in sharp contrast to 24, I think, because Dante wanted to distance himself from those poets in 24, and here he wants to show um, a similarity. He's trying to si assimilate himself with, it, with it, a certain kind of poetry that was uh, for for which metaphysics epistemology and theology were all central, okay? So it's a philosophical kind of love poetry, all right? Um, and I think he also redeems this love tradition, which is in a certain sense was condemned in Inferno V, okay, with Francesca. So this courtly love tradition that was, that caused, in a, in a way, I suppose, at least that, that Francesca claimed caused her downfall um, in saying that the Galahalt was, um, was the book, right, in Inferno 5. Here he redeems it 
and he, he purges it and cleanses it, okay? Um, we can start off by reading um, the Tercet that begins at line 94. Whenever, he's, whenever Guido Guinizelli identifies himself to the pilgrim, he says, such as in the grief of Lycurgus, the two sons became on seeing their mother again. I became, but with more restraint, when I heard speak his own name, the father of me and of others, my betters. Whoever have used the sweet and graceful rhymes of love. And without hearing or speech, I went on a long way in thought, gazing at him, and did not, for the fire, go near him. Okay? So Dante Regis, he, he loses his faculty of speech here because he's, he's in awe, almost like a child before his father. Okay? So his behavior sort of imitates his relationship to, um, to Gwyneth Sedley. Okay? Um, all right. And I'll point out here as well that, that the, one, of the, one of the main differences, I suppose, is between the, the two poets is symbolized by the casting of his shadow on the fire, right? So his act, the reality of his presence there in his body is what really is with the physical aspect that separates him from the others. Um, and it stands in for the, um, the aspect of his poetry that separates him from the rest of, the rest of these poets as well. Um, Let's see. And since we're talking about poetic genealogies, it's interesting that Dante is, uh, he refers to him as a father, but then Guinizelli responds by saying, oh, brother, he there whom I point out to thee was a better craftsman of the mother tongue. Verses of love and tales of romance, he has surpassed them all, okay? So, in, the, in, these, in this, these, what, 15, 20 lines, Dante is a child before his father and is then equated with his father by being a brother. So they're put on the same level and they're assigned another father, okay? So the grandfather of them all becomes the father. And this father, I guess, who's not named is Arnaud Daniel, okay? Um, an important poet for Dante in the Rime Petrose, the, the stony rhymes, which Professor Matsota mentioned. Um, Dante imitated him, imitated him in those in those rhymes. He was a poet famous for his difficulty in reading. Uh, his, in, in under, you, it's very, very hard to understand an example of the Trobar Clus, okay? Um, so, <coughs> and in this same paragraph here, in this, in this same series of, of tercets, paragraph in the English, again, we have the differentiation of um, the kind of school, I suppose, that Dante is um, associating himself with and the other school which, which he wants to differentiate himself. Because he says, like Arnaut is different from um, the one from Limoges, <coughs> so he is different from Guitone, Guitone d'Arezzo, who was named alongside Bonagiunta and Giacomo Valentini. So he's separating himself from and sort of aligning himself with a different kind of poetry, all right? Um, so, let me gather my thoughts. He, um, so, I, so I suppose he reinforces the kind of genealogy that he wants to create for himself, all right? <coughs> now this genealogy too, I guess, has its own consequences in the modern age because the word the, the words in Italian for the better craftsman in miglior fabbro were the words with, with which T.S. Eliot dedicated the wasteland to Ezra Pound as you probably know right so <coughs> this conversation here really becomes an emblem for happy poetic relationships I suppose in which you can recognize your betters recognize your forefathers and at the same time, come out with something that you recognize as new, okay? All right? Um. <coughs> and some scholars have pointed out that we didn't read, I don't think we, we read, you, 
concentrated much on Inferno 24 and 25, where Dante <coughs> utilizes a number of metaphors from Ovid and Lucan, and he has this, there's this topos called the Takiat Nunc. Uh, be silent now, Lucan, be silent now, Ovid, he says. And he basically steals from their lines without recognizing <laughs> them, okay? Saying that he is surpassing them, but at the same time as he's surpassing them, he's using their own poetry to surpass them, okay? <coughs> People have pointed out that in these Conti of the Thieves, that Dante is participating in the sin by stealing from Ovid and Lucan, and that this kind of re poetic relationship is a negative one, right? That he's stealing the identity of the other. Well, here we have a different kind of understanding of I poetic identity, right? We have one that that recognizes the paternity of the, of the father, while at the same time allows the son to come into his own. And this coming into his own um, is, I think, pointed out by, um, by Dante the poet whenever he says, then, at line, between lines uh, 130 and 140, then perhaps to give place to others who were near him, he disappeared through the fire as though the water, as, as through the water a fish goes to the bottom, okay? So here the, the father moves out of his way so that Dante can go on, okay? Um, and I guess he, he can progress, okay? That he doesn't get in his way, all right? Um, so, If Dante recognizes these people, these poets, as his predecessors, um, how does he differentiate himself? Like, how in this canto does he differentiate himself from them? Um, I think we can look at it through the lens of Canto 25, um, where the paternal virtue, um, the soul, uh, the generation of the soul granted the paternal virtue its place, while simultaneously claiming claimed a direct creation of the soul by um, the spiration of the Holy Spirit. I think Dante's in poetic individuality um, grows out of the artifice, the style that they concentrate on here, the sweet detti d'amore, the sweet sayings of love that he um, attributes to Guinizelli. So it grows out of the stylistic artifice that these two poets represent, Arnaud and, um, and Guido to form something new, a new kind of speech, a new kind of poetic speech that's imbibed with the divine, that's in guided by theological and moral meaning. Um, and I think we can see this in how the, um, how these pair of poets are, are cleansed and how they're represented in this canto, all right? For example, Guinizelli, when he first calls out to Dante, before we know who he is, before he's even identified himself, I think it's around line 17 and following. Um, he's <laughs> he's uh, He says, O thou that goest behind the others, not from tardiness, but perhaps from reverence, answer me who burn with thirst and with fire. Okay? Now, the line in Italian is, in foco ardo, all right? Now, this is a direct quotation of Guinizelli's on poetry, okay? Um, in a sonnet which he says, in gran pene, in foco ardo, okay? So I, in great pain and fire I burn, okay? So in foco ardo is basically repeated verbatim. So the, the love poet who's burning for his, for his lady, metaphorically, in his sonnet, is now burning literally in the penitentiary fire, in the, like the penitent fire um, that's purging his sin, okay? Um, so I think this punishment shows how the perspective of purgatory is really modifying, uh, giving a sort of moral sense to the love poetry that Guinizelli belonged, this love po school of love poetry that Guinizelli belonged to, okay? Um, another thing that differentiates them like I said before, with Dante's shadow showing that he's actually there and that they're um, <coughs> in his body, in flesh, points to something else. And that is that his lady 
is actually the beginning of a chain, it started a chain of grace, right? So that there's a connection in his, not just a metaphysical connection or epistemological connection um, and value to his lady, but a theological value as well, okay? Since he's, like he says at line 58, I go up hence no, uh, no, not to be longer blind. A lady is above who gains grace for me, by which I bring my mortal part through your world. So what these poets couldn't recognize in their own lifetime, Dante is able to because of his poetry, this um, bringing together that he does, which is actually the newness in the new, sweet new style, I think, um, which isn't just metaphysical, but it's theological, okay? Um, so to put it another way, if for Guinizelli, Arno Daniel, Guido Cavalcanti, who's not mentioned here, all right, um, again. Um, if for these poets, the lady w was a philosophical or intellectual phantasm, I suppose. I said. Um, for Dante, she was a real woman who enacted a real change in his life, okay? Who did that, that, and that caused the chain of grace to descend into his own personal story. And his poetry, I think, seems, seeks to close the gap between the metaphysical theological reality of God and the historical contingent reality of history and Dante's own personal story in that history, okay? So love poetry for Dante takes on an entirely new meaning here, okay? <coughs> and I think Guinizelli shows that he understands this difference with the perspective that Purgatory gives him. Towards the end of the canto, when he asks Dante, to say a pater noster for him, to Christ, whenever he enters heaven, okay? So it's really a, con a, a conversion, I think, of, of love poetry, a purgation of the worldliness of love poetry, okay? Um, and finally, I want to say, we're going to end a little bit early because I actually have to run to another <laughs> building to teach right after this, um, my own class. But I want to conclude by saying a few words about our note. All right, it's, it's very peculiar that Dante, this is the only place I believe in the Divine Comedy where um, another modern romance language is, quote, is uh, quoted. Um, it's not Italian, basically. So I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure it's the only place. Um, now, Arnaut was, was famous, like I said, for his obscurity, the extreme difficulty of his, exp of his poetic expression. And here, what does Dante do to him? Even though he, he quotes him in the original, right? I mean, this, he didn't really write these lines. These are lines are Dante. But what he does is he makes this difficult hidden poet come out in the open, right? To quote him, um, he says, so much, our note says, so much does your courteous question please me that I neither can nor would conceal myself from you. I am Arnot, who weep and sing as I go. I see with grief past, f past follies and see you rejoicing the day I hope for before me. Now I beg of you, by that goodness which guides you to the summit of the stairway, to take thought in due time for my pain. And then he hid himself in the fire that refined him. Okay? <laughs> So th there's a little bit of a, Dante's playing here with, with Arnaud's own language. If he was a difficult poet and poet of love, um, besides, Dante makes him really come out into the open and say what, he, what he's saying. So, um, and here also, typical words from the Provencal uh, traditions, such as the value, you know, the, the valor, joie, um, Cortez and Chantan, they all ha take on different kinds of meanings. That, that, that before the, the valor or value of the, um, of the love poet was not what it is here, right? It takes on a completely different meaning in purgatory, okay? So he really stages in, in our notes own words the purification, cleansing, and bringing out into openness of what love poetry should really be, where it should really lead you, okay? Um, 
And I guess to conclude, um, I wanted to say that in the next canto, you'll see Dante submitting himself to the same kind of purgation as these poets. If these poets are cleansed by this wall, of, by this fire that refines them, he will end up passing through a wall of flame in order to get to where he can enter into the, um, the, par uh, the terrestrial paradise. Um, so that he's in reality cleansing him himself of the same kind of um, issue, I suppose. All right? Um, And I guess now, I, mean, if we can t I can take a few questions <coughs> if um, you have any, hopefully. <laughs> it wasn't too disjointed, the lecture. But I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, or try to. I think you can reconcile them. I mean, whenever Dante, whenever he, he meets Vincelli, he's silent, right? He doesn't automatically make himself, he doesn't move his father out of the way. Statius and Dante both know that, Dante, uh, that Virgil is not going to be able to go the whole way. They know that he's only going to be able to lead them a certain amount of the, of the, of the trip, of the, of, the, of, the, of the journey, right? So, um, So I guess I would, I would interpret it as an act of reverence, just like Dante's silence whenever he meets, um, whenever he meets Guinizelli is an act of reverence, that he doesn't push them out of the way. He doesn't <coughs> trample them. He, he's not in a hurry, I suppose. So does that make, does that make any sense? I think, it, I think it's where you could interpret Statius's, uh, if, if you want to see him s interpret that as him slowing his way on the way to God, basically, then you could interpret it as an act of reverence to the person who allowed him to actually be there and not in limbo, right? So that, that's how I would, how I would interpret it. And um, that Dante in this, in 26, is reverent to his, to his father. At the same time, as he's, showing him, he's showing how he's moving beyond them by giving a theological meaning to their questionable worldly love poetry. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> when Dante talks about the inspiration issue by the tribe of the Christian Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. is he making love synonymous to the Holy Spirit? And if so, um, don't looking back to the Vietnam War well, when he, when he personifies love in, in the masculine. Mm -hmm. I think there that that the, he's thinking of. Let's see. I think I think in that at that point he's thinking of love. Um, I, I think Thomas Saint Thomas Aquinas mentions love as the perce like a procession of love, as the movement of the Holy Spirit uh, within the Trinity between the Father and the Son, so that both really are. Within, I, I participate in the same spirit. So, yes, I think in that spot he is really talking about love as the Holy Spirit, as this kind of 
or at least as, as parallel to it. It's ambiguous, right? He, said, he doesn't really say that love is the Holy Spirit, does he? he he's purposefully ambiguous, I think. Because love poetry always has that, the possibility of leading you astray because it's an aesthetic practice, right? It's, it's dolce, right? It's sweet. So I think that, 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 uh, um, that, yes, he is talking about love as the Holy Spirit, you know, as this divine love, but he's also talking about, so uh, I guess in reality that, that there is a connection between you know, the, the contingent historical world and the metaphysical world of God, um, but that he leaves it ambiguous because it can always be misinterpreted and the aesthetic can always lead you back down to the terrestrial well, okay. So does that does that make sense? Okay. Is it, oh, Griffin. Okay. Well, I guess if, if, if the question really had been about what is the nature of the soul, like what is, like what, what is Aristotle saying in the De Anima about the thing, maybe Virgil could have told him about that. But the actual question is, you know, what is the nature, how does the soul live in the afterlife? And that is an entirely Christian question. That's based on Christian theology. So I think the fact that, um, that Virgil defers to Statius there is showing is connected with the fact that that the question is actually about you know the afterlife right. and the afterlife is specifically a Christian context that Statius is permitted to know and not Virgil right does that make sense yeah. okay I mean. technically yeah. but uh, the the fact that he actually asks Virgil first I don't know maybe he's he's saying that that's uh, it's actually in Aristotle you know this idea of the immortality of the soul in the after that it's actually there and um, perhaps Virgil could answer it. But then Virgil defers to Statius because it's he, because it's a theological question that he's not privy to. Is that okay. <laughs> All right. Well we're gonna end a little bit early. I hope that's okay. So I can go change gears. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you for your attention and for putting up with me. All right. <laughs> Thank you.